hardest part is always knowing where to begin. It really is. That's the hardest part of starting this whole story. It's a beautiful story, one of those stories that begins with Once Upon a Time and ends with me smoking a lot. Uh, so, where do we begin? This is Josh Kesselman. At a first glance, he's a popular figure online with a whopping 2.1 million Instagram followers. Never throw out a sheet of raw. This is the best rolling paper in the world, and every sheet deserves to be smoked. It's about making the best smoke you've ever had in your life. But make no mistake, Josh Kesselman is not a social media influencer. Instead, He's a passionate businessman behind three of the greatest rolling paper brands to ever exist. Josh Kesselman is widely known on the internet for his high energy and positive attitude. But what lies beneath the surface? Who is the man behind the paper? To learn Josh Kesselman's story, we have to go back to the days long before social media. The days when influence was spread by word of mouth. What you do with your life is up to you. If you become a pothead, you risk blowing the most important time of your life. When I was a little kid growing up in New York City, about five years old, my dad only knew one magic trick. He would take his rolling paper, an old, beautiful Spanish rice paper named Marfil Arroz, and he would light it on fire and throw it in the air, and it would just disappear. Nothing would come down, not even ash. And at five years old, this was amazing to me. It was magic. And it was the only magic trick my dad knew, so he did it every year. While Josh's fascination with rolling papers started at a young age, it didn't truly take hold until years later, when he was in high school. The marijuana available in our streets and schoolyards has become more than 10 times stronger in just the past four years. You go forward many years, and now you're in high school, or I'm in high school. And me and my friends all start smoking. When I would smoke with my friends as we got into the high school years and stuff, and we're all partying our fucking nuts off and doing that kind of thing. All these kinds of things is all I cared about was, I just cared about the paper or the pipe. I was infatuated with all those things. I was obsessed with them, really. I had a huge collection, and I began collecting rolling papers. Josh Kesselman's collection of rolling papers would continue to grow throughout high school. And by the year 1990, Josh would leave New York City to attend the University of Florida. It was there where his rolling paper collection would begin to evolve into a unique business opportunity. So I put my collection online and I was the first American to really put his rolling paper collection online. There were other collectors in Europe, but I was the only American. And so I began trading with the other collectors in Europe. And so we, I would send them some little packs here or there, they'd send me back something. But then while I was still in school in Florida, I opened up my first smoke shop. Knuckleheads, Josh's first smoke shop, would open up in Gainesville in 1993. And while it mainly sold bongs and pipes at the time, it would also sell a selection of rare imported rolling papers. These continued sales between the European paper importers and his Gainesville smoke shop would establish Josh Kesselman as a rising member in the global rolling paper industries community. So in my store, the way that my store was a success was I really talked to everybody that came in the door. And from the beginning, when I was first opening up, people came in and told me I must carry, I will not say the brand because that will probably get me sued somehow, a certain brand of natural cigarettes. And they told me how it was natural and better than commercial cigarettes. Great. I ordered it in. Back then you had to buy it directly from the producer. I did. Comes in. I immediately sell it. I open up thinking it's going to be this beautiful natural thing. And it was just a regular white looking cigarette. And I sold it to them and they smoked it and they're sitting there talking to me, telling me how it's natural and better. And I'm looking right at them as they're smoking and it's this white cigarette. Now you're talking to a dude who knows paper. He loves paper. And I'm looking at this like, dude. <laughs> That's not natural. I know paper, I don't know, like, this is a wood-based paper. I don't know if you ever cut down a tree, but it's not white on the inside. That's not natural. And I was just like, okay, whatever. But I knew right then and there what was needed, which was a truly natural paper, one that was still the natural color, which would probably be translucent brown. Running a successful smoke shop in Florida is a risky game. Due to many laws prohibiting the sale of drug paraphernalia, bongs must only be referred to as water pipes and must be sold with the clear intent to smoke tobacco. 
This gray area of legality gives police officers the unique opportunity to raid and harass stores who are selling bongs whenever they decide it's convenient. And that's exactly what happened to Josh Kesselman's store in early 1996. You take great risk when you have a real head shop. I would have stayed with those stores till the end of time. I'd be behind my counter in Gainesville, Florida, interacting with every dude that walks in the door. But the universe isn't like that, you know? <laughs> I had the feds come in on me, kick the door in, those fucking helmets on, you know what I mean? Stormtrooper helmets, holding me down with a machine gun to my head, overselling a bong to the daughter of the head of the U.S. Customs Service and special agent in charge. So the feds come in, boom, that's the end of the stores. But what they did is they also taught me a lot of stuff. Ironically, they taught me that in their opinion, all rolling papers are legal. Even these ones that had leaves all over them, they didn't give a shit. Nope, that's legal, it's a paper. That was a multi-use product, they're bongs, those are illegal as fuck. And so they pushed me, ironically, into the paper business. So now I'm kicked out of my stores basically and it's time to get out of Gainesville, Florida. They made it clear, get the fuck out of here, kid. I'd always dreamed of moving out to the desert. And so I did. After selling off his multiple head shops, Josh Kesselman would begin supplying and distributing imported European rolling papers in bulk to smoke shops across the country. Through his newly formed company, Herbal Bar Industries, HBI International wouldn't catch its big break until in 1997, when a fellow rolling paper collector would put Josh Kesselman in contact with a man by the name of Jose Emilio. And one day one of the collectors hit me up and told me, Josh, there is a man coming from Alcoy. He is reopening basically the oldest rolling paper factory in the world. And he had gotten these old machines and he had set them up in what was at the time an abandoned factory. It was on the edge of a cliff. It was an old factory that used to be powered by a waterfall. But that's a different story. Jose Emilio came to America to look for someone to sell his paper. And the collectors told me about him and said I must meet with him. So I went and met with Jose Emilio and I sat down. And most of the meeting was like this, because I was very young at the time. Jose Emilio sat there with his arms crossed, looking at me, looking down at me, speaking broken Spanish and English, and my Spanish is muy terrible. So we did our best to communicate. And at one point, with his arms crossed, he looked down at me and said, Josh, why do you even care about rolling paper? So I told him the story of my dad and the marfil at Oz and the trick. And Jose lit up and turned to me and said, Josh! I made my filaros. My father made my filaros. My grandfather made our filaros. His great grandfather, between his side and his wife's side, they'd always been in that region, and they'd all had this long, long history of rolling paper and that particular brand that my dad used to smoke. Now, the brand was long gone, obviously. When the factory was bankrupted, the brand was taken. But we decided right then and there that we were going to bring back my filaros, and we couldn't name it that. So I decided to name it Elements after the elements that are used to make the rice paper. Elements would immediately become a successful brand, quickly gaining popularity for its thin and slow-burning papers. At the same time Elements was launched, Josh would also launch a line of flavored rolling papers that would go on to be known as Juicy J's. And we also had these old machines that could make flavored paper. So we started making flavored paper again. And I named that Juicy Jays, which goes back to this nickname I had in high school. I shouldn't even tell the story, but I went really quick. I cut school one day in high school with some friends of mine, and we went off in this awful white Mustang GT convertible that I had with gold rims, dude. And this was like a long time ago when it was, yeah. And then the fucking Vanilla Ice song comes out, Ice Ice Baby, and all of a sudden my car went from like super cool to super not cool. Like it was, everywhere I went, people would like sing the song and point at me and say, call me Vanilla Ice. So one day we cut school to look for LL Cool J, we really did, and he sang in his song how he hung out on Farmer's Boulevard in Queens. You know Farmer's Boulevard, that's where I hang out, that's where we cool, that's where, that's where the crib's at, the place to be. So we go around, the four of us, looking for LL Cool J, stopping and asking people on the corner if you know where LL Cool J hangs out. This really happened. <laughs> And so that night, word got around back to my friends in New York about what we had done that day. And I pulled up in my white Mustang GT convertible that everyone used to call me Ice, Ice Ice Baby with. And someone said, yo, yo, here comes Vanilla Ice. And someone else said, yo, no, that ain't Vanilla Ice's Stang, man. Yo, that's Cool J's Stang. Baby, my name is Josh. And so I ended up with the nickname Cool J from that point on. And with these flavored papers we put out, the first one was menthol and I named that one Cool J's after that nickname. 
The second one, or right about the same time, we put out, right after that, Watermelon. And I couldn't call it Cool Jays Watermelon, so I named that one Juicy Jays. And yeah, thus Juicy Jays was born. And thankfully, Juicy Jays did really well as well. Juicy Jays did more than really well. It was a hit, unlike any other flavored paper before it. The watermelon flavor really tasted like watermelon. And the raspberry really tasted like raspberry. It tastes so real. Try some more. The strawberries taste like strawberries. The snozberries taste like snozberries. Over the next five years, HBI International would continue to sell the brands Josh created, Elements and Juicy J's, alongside European imports, such as the French Mascote Papers and the Spanish Smoking Brand Papers. This continued period of sales and growth would cause Herbal Bar Industries to become one of the most successful smoke shop distributors on the planet and would cement Josh Kesselman as a figurehead in the world of rolling papers. But Josh wasn't quite satisfied yet. His next goal was to make a rolling paper even better than Marfil Arroz, even better than Elements. A rolling paper so perfect that it would finally make people understand why the rolling paper you buy matters at all. So I went around to all the producers at that time, producers of the bulk material, the factory producers of bulk, and I explained to them what the idea was, and I tried to get them on board to make this for me. And every one of them said no. I even went to one that is one of my competitors, because they had their own mass mill. And I went to them for this, and they laughed at me. They laughed at me and said, in a different language, no one will want to smoke a paper bag, Josh. And the whole room laughed. Ah, uh, and they laughed me out of their office. This all happened. Eventually. One of the smaller factory producers told Josh that he would sell him the pulp material, but only if he bought close to $1 million worth of it. It was the ultimate risk. I had to pretty much risk everything I had made up to that point just to, just to accomplish raw. And it was scary, but I had no other choice but to do it. I couldn't have, been, I couldn't have lived with myself any other way. And so I did it. We took the risk brought it all up to Alcoy, and we made it into rolling paper. Throughout 2004, Josh Kesselman would perfect the first ever iteration of raw papers. And by 2005, raw papers would go into mass production. Since it was distributed through HBI, raw would face an almost instant success, ending up front and center alongside papers like ZigZag in many local smoke shops. However, Raw's true success would come years later, in 2011, when rapper Currency would take up raw papers over the more popular blunt raps. See, at the time, blunt raps were considered the coolest way to smoke. Almost every rapper was seen smoking blunts, causing the tobacco leaf raps to skyrocket in popularity in the late 90s. But the thing about blunt raps is that they're incredibly harsh, leading to a smoking experience that leaves many stoners, wondering why they just wasted two grams of weed on a nicotine headache. So when the brown, blunt-like raw papers started getting passed around in elite smoking circles, a few rappers would decide they were going to make the switch. Currency sings about it in a song, Five on it, and he's saying raw paper, not a blunt. It's raw paper, not a blunt. Good people see him smoking brown. I had no idea, because those guys were all smoking blunts. I didn't want to convert them off blunts. I'd love to, but I didn't even think that was even possible. It wasn't they were, that they were smoking blunts, and it isn't that all rappers switched. It was that the people who truly enjoyed smoking, everybody who smokes well, everybody wants to smoke this. There are these intrinsic qualities that I can't even describe to you with words but it's something that you just know. When you're smoking it, you connect to it, you feel it. It just smokes better. This is the old paper, the old way. And this is the way raw is made. I think I'm the only one who still makes it this way. And so as this paper went out into the world and people began smoking it, especially the connoisseurs, friends of mine like Currency and these guys, but once you smoke it, it's hard to go smoke something else. It just connects with you. Currency also introduced Josh Kesselman to one of his friends. Wiz Khalifa. Wiz's instant love of raw papers would lead to him recording a song called Raw that was released in 2014. After that, Raw's popularity would skyrocket, making it the most popular rolling papers in the world. 
Just like Juicy J's, Josh would continue to expand Raw's product line, adding not just different paper styles, but also tons of natural, unrefined tips. Back in the 1990s, there was a guy named Joe Kerr who started making tips and selling them to Amsterdam, and I convinced him to start selling them to me in America. The popularity of raw papers and tips had completely changed the weed smoking world for the better. Gone were the days of cancerous blunt wraps. Gone were the days of the dreaded dirty bong. Josh Kesselman had accomplished his goal. He finally made people see the importance of quality rolling papers, but he wasn't done yet. For Josh's next goal, he would try to change the real world by solving global problems. I give back a chunk, I've given back millions, and we do it in a really well-placed way where we've had incredible effects, where this fucking weird smoker dude is the key water uh, supplier, or uh, the benefactor, whatever you want to call it, to all of Mother Teresa's hospitals in Ethiopia. And I think at this point, we've, we've touched every single one of them. The Raw Giving Foundation has donated millions of dollars to help create sustainable water resources in Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya. This is the new solar-powered water project. This is how we connect the old to the new. In Judaism, there's a term called a mensch. It's a Yiddish word that basically describes someone who not only has honor in their community, but also has a reputation for integrity. Someone who knows who they are and what they stand for. Josh Kesselman embodies the term mensch. In the face of a society that looks down on habitual marijuana smokers, Josh has managed to become a role model for those looking to enjoy their smoking experience, as well as they enjoy bettering the community around them. And that is probably his greatest contribution. You really want to give back. We're always trying to make ourselves better, make our products better. Nowadays, it seems more and more like we're getting closer and closer to the federal government ending its prohibition on marijuana. And maybe that has something to do with people like Josh Kesselman changing the public opinion on what a real stoner looks like. The more success that came with all of this, the more it allowed me to be free, I started making myself even freer and freer and getting ridiculous because I could just be the guy I always wanted to be. Perhaps a real stoner is someone who is as passionate and educated about their weed consumption as they are about every hobby or goal in their life. If you understand this as you smoke it, you understand that what this is all really about, which is beauty, yeah? <laughs> and fashion and love and everything fucking positive. So I ask you to enjoy your smoke a little more than you did before. Maybe now you know a little more about it than you ever did. Maybe you know more about it than you wanted to know. But this little paper, this little beautiful translucent brown paper that was a figment of my imagination up until some years ago, this tiny little thing, it's amazing how much it's changed the world.